Hello, welcome, welcome everybody. Really good to see you. And I'm here with our dear friends, Dr. Uh, Gary Hill and dear Dr. Baruch. Uh, and we're here on uh, discussing an exciting subject today, continuing our discussion on the rapture. And wow, isn't it amazing to have that solid assurance that Jesus is coming back during these crazy times. Welcome, uh, friends. Uh, I've got here um, Baruch and Gary with us. Would you like to say hi to everybody? Yes, uh, Gary Hill over here, and I very much appreciate Straight Kingdom Talk programs where we get to hit important issues straight away and especially get Baruch Corman's thoughts on these things. So let me pray by way of introduction here. Lord God, this is such, I know, a key time for our hearts to be seeking you in the details of Scripture that matter. And on this great subject today mm. of your return and how you come for your glorified bride, guide us along. May it be just the way that reaches into the hearts of our listeners that needs to be. We offer it up in Jesus' name. We're going to be looking Amen. at of the rapture of the church, and um, Simmel and Ethan are with me here, and we work together with LoveIsrael.org with Baruch from Discovery Bible, and I very much like the honest, forthright, forthright way that Baruch goes into things that matter. And so, Baruch, as you're thinking about the subject of the rapture, how and why does it matter on, a, on an overview, you might say, coming into it? If we don't believe in the promises of God, we're not going to be faithful people. One of the things that made Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob faithful to God is that they believed his covenant promises and they were pursuing his covenant promises. And the rapture, Paul calls it in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, our blessed hope. And hope produces endurance, perseverance. So there are going to be difficult times coming for believers, intense persecution, and it's a strong faith in, in God's promise of deliverance from these things and being ultimately removed before the wrath of God falls that is going to produce in us a attitude and a behavior that's pleasing to him. Oh, yeah. Amen. Yes. Yes, yeah, Simmel, if you could pose a few questions, start running off with, uh, I know that there's the importance of the tribulation versus the great tribulation, how that all fits in. How would you carry that forward for Baruch to respond to, Simmel? Yeah, Baruch, uh, you have, um, this is a wonderful subject, and many people, when they talk about the rapture, <clears throat> are wondering, okay, uh, difficult times are coming. Um, and people are trying to pinpoint the timing of the rapture. Um, how would you, and some of them say, I'm, I don't really think about the rapture much because people have all kinds of opinions, whether he's coming before the tribulation, during the tribulation, or after the tribulation. Some don't even believe there is a time of tribulation. Um, but we know very much that God's word has answers to these. Um, how would you um, comfort people who are confused by all kinds of different views or have certain convictions and are very sensitive on these subjects? I, I like the way you pose this question because people are confused and they're confused because they, they see things based upon how man, the terms that men have put it in rather than the terms that the scripture does. For example, we know that there is that 70th week, that last seven years that Daniel speaks of. Nowhere in the scripture do we call that, does, does Yeshua, Jesus, or Paul, or any of the prophets call this the tribulation period. This is a man's creation. Now, will there be difficult things in that time? Absolutely. But it's very problematic and confusing and produces 
individuals with, with conflict to always think of the rapture in term of tribulation because what do we mean by tribulation? So biblically, yeah. we find that God does something different. He does not put the rapture in light of the seven years, but he makes a promise that the rapture will happen before the wrath of God. We talked about that in our first first installment about a month ago, and, and it's a good place to begin. So our promise is never does God say that we're not going to have tribulation, that we're going to avoid tribulation. Quite the contrary. He says, for example, in Acts 14, I believe Acts 14, 22, we, we dealt with this last time, that, that it's necessary to go through much tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God. But what we won't go through is the wrath of God. Now, something I want to pick up on that Gary spoke of in a few minutes, and that is the term the great tribulation and what that refers to in the term great tribulation. But in order to do that, let's go to where we, we, we mentioned Matthew 24, this great teaching concerning the end times. And the teacher here is, is Yeshua himself, our Lord and Savior, Amen. the Messiah, the Son of God. So if we could look there and in the first few verses, we see, and I'm going to pose this to, to Gary in a moment, but Yeshua is coming out of the temple. And presumably he was there worshiping as an example. He's, of course, the son of God, but he also subjected himself to everything that the word of God commanded. So he would go up for the festivals and presumably he would also worship. And so he's leaving worship and the disciples come to him. And Gary, do you remember the, the question that the disciples asked him? There in, in the first couple of verses of of chapter 24 yes it's quite pointed isn't it would you like to say what that question was anyway i'll, I'll, I'll I, I do a good job of answering and asking my own questions but they come and they ask him do you not see these these wonderful stones and buildings that are on the Temple Mount. And, and they asked the question concerning the temple and also the buildings, it's in the plural. So the buildings would probably have been those that housed the Sanhedrin. So we're talking about the center of worship and the center of government. And notice how Yeshua responded to them. He says in, in verse two, he says, Basically, truly, I say to you that not one stone will be left upon another. And I'll ask either Simo or Gary, what time frame do you think he was speaking about? Is this what he's speaking about right here? Is this last days or is it another time period that, that he was referring to these stones being torn down? Well, I think that... Um conventional commentaries on the evangelical shelf would place it at AD 70. So we're speaking about the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. And, and I agree with you. That's exactly right. So why does this scripture begin with speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem? Well, if you look at verse three, there's a change. Now we mentioned that he was coming out of the temple when the disciples went up to him with this question concerning the, the beautiful buildings on the Temple Mount. But, but now in verse 3, there's a change of location. They're no longer there in Jerusalem at the Temple, but they're at the Mount of Olives. And one of the things that we emphasize as Kingdom Hope College is good biblical hermeneutics. And when there's a change of direction or location, it usually, usually speaks about a change of issue. Uh, of topic. Well, notice that the disciples come to him with more questions. They want to know when this will be, but also they want to know the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And this is the first time that that phrase end, and we'll mention this again several times, Yeshua and the disciples speak of this. 
But this now takes it from 70 AD to uniting what happened in 70 AD with the last days. And this is the important thing that, that we need to realize. What Jesus was saying was this. He prophesied 40 years in advance of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. And let me ask you, Simmel, was he accurate in that, that prophecy? Oh, spot on, dead accurate. Perfectly accurate. And what the writer of Matthew's gospel is telling us in how he was inspired to put the scripture together in the same way that he was accurate, perfectly accurate, as Simmel says, spot on. He is also going to be spot on in what he says concerning the end of the age. So this is not as some, what I would call, uh, people who are are falsely understanding Matthew 24 that wants to put in, it's becoming more popular to try to put all of this into what has already happened. This is incorrect. Although the first part speaks about 70 AD and the destruction of the temple, he spoke on that to confirm his prophecy is perfect and what he says concerning the last days will also be perfect. Now, several times, I believe three or four times in these first 14 verses, he speaks about the end. And the question that I have for, for both of you is, what are some possible understandings of that, that term end in, in this scripture? You know, when he says, for example, the end is not yet. These things have to be. It's necessary for kingdom to rise up against kingdom and nation against nation and earthquakes and famines and pestilence, but the end is not yet. What end is he speaking about here? What do you think, Gary or Simmel? Well, there is this uh, question asked here, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So. Um, this has to do with the end of the age when um, this age that we know it um, uh, comes to an end and Jesus returns as, as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, that was the question that he was answering. And he said, many of these signs will be taking place, but that will not mean that I'm coming right then at that moment. Yes, and uh, another layer is that the end of the age is not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and why do you say that? I agree with you totally, Gary, but could you flesh that out a little bit? Yes, the um, premillennial view is the formal term that summarizes that the teaching of the scripture is that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he returns back to the earth, will establish a thousand year reign upon the earth. So though he ends this age, this particular time period, some call it the church of the, the church age, others the era of the spirit, that will be uh, consummated, terminated by his coming to the earth at, at the rapture, the Latin term for to be lifted up with euphoric, <laughs> rapturous elation feelings, that there are still a thousand years uh, called the millennium, to go before the dissolution of Earth's elements, um, as we know. That's the uh, premillennial position, which um, I believe you affirm heartily. Do you not? I, I absolutely do, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I too. Now, let me, let me flesh out something, because if we could go to verse 14, Matthew 24, verse 14, this teaches us something very important, and that is, there's the end of the age, and that is prior to the establishment of the kingdom of God. But there's also, and I would argue, the real emphasis of the word end in this first part of Matthew 24 mm. is the end of the church age. And the church age. You will have to repeat that, Baruch. You are speaking no, about the end of said. the church age. Uh, you broke up there. Could you please um, repeat that? 
So the the well, we're having some uh, internet connection problems. Uh, Baruch, uh, you're speaking about the end, uh, as the in the end of the church age. Um, could you please repeat that? Uh, All right. The well, end. Baruch is coming through. Um, Gary, are you with us, Gil? Yeah, Baruch is wanting to emphasize that um, we're having a consummation of this present age, and it will usher in yet another phase of God's testamental program. And we need to be faithful as it consummates. Do we have you back? That's right. Y yes, I think I'm back now. What I was saying was, in Matthew 24, verse 14, the end there, he's been speaking to his disciples throughout. Beginning in, certainly in verse 3, when they come to him at the Mount of Olives, he's speaking specifically to his disciples, but it has relevance, especially for his disciples in the last days. And that may be you and me and those who are, are watching. And in verse 14, it speaks of the end of the church age. And, and one, one thing we see here is that immediately after verse 14, there's a very important event, and that's the abomination of desolation. And immediately after that abomination of desolation, which we all know what that is, we talked about it the first time. This is when the Antichrist will go into the Holy of Holies and, and exalt himself above all that's of God to the extent that he proclaims himself God. And, and what's going to happen there? Well, Israel's not going to receive him. And this is going to bring about Israel's rejection of the Antichrist. Very important that, that our, our, our viewers see this. Israel will reject the Antichrist. And that rejection of the Antichrist is going to be bring, bring about the, the what's called Etzerah Yaakov, a time of trouble for Jacob, Jacob's trouble. I, I have good news. We will not be here for Jacob's trouble, the, the church. And if you look immediately after the abomination of desolation, what we find is there's a change. Instead of Messiah using the language you, 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 as he does throughout verses 3 through 14 and 15, because we'll see the abomination of desolation. Beginning in verse 16, he speaks specifically to those who are in Judea. He speaks about great tribulation, not the great tribulation, but great tribulation. If you look at verse 21 of Matthew 24, he speaks of the fact that there will be great tribulation. Now, how do we know it's not the great tribulation? Because there's no definite articles. The great tribulation, and this is going to be something that surprises many of, of the people that are listening, and that is when we look at Revelation, and in chapter 7, the great tribulation refers to those who were persecuted for faith in Messiah. It does not relate to Israel. It doesn't relate to the period of God's wrath, the second half. It relates to the time when people are being put to death and tortured and persecuted for the faith. That is what the scripture refers to in regard to the great tribulation, what believers are going to go through. Any response to that, gentlemen? I like good news. <laughs> Amen. And then, since we're in Matthew 24, I want us to go to a very important verse. If we could look at verse 36, Matthew 24, verse 36, because here we have the clearest image of the rapture from, from Yeshua's teaching. And it really confirms 
everything that that we've been talking about now just so people can have a, a good outline beginning in verse 3 through verse 15 this has all relevance for the church for believers matthew 24 verses 3 through 15 all is about what the church is going to see experience suffer in the last days verses 16 through 31 deals with israel it talks about those in judea speaks about those that are fleeing uh, in the wilderness mentions about the rainy season the winter and also on shabbat speaking to to jewish people but then after after that section which ends with the second coming not the rapture but the second coming because it's at the end of jacob's trouble that messiah comes the the end of the the age before the establishment of the kingdom of god in verse 32 he begins to tell once more believers he talks he's summarizing He's going to flesh out more of this. And he says in verse 32, watch the fig tree. So true believers are going to be watching the fig tree. And Hosea tells us that the fig tree is Israel. And when Israel is prosperous, that is a sign that the, the last days are approaching. But I want to go down, if we could, to verse 36. Because in this next section, we're going to see a clear description of the rapture and if people do not see these verses in their correct way they're going to be very confused about what the word of god says concerning the rapture so if we could go to verse 36 notice what it says now i'm going to be translating from the texas receptus it says but concerning those days and that hour no one knows what don't we know? We don't know the date, the calendar date of the rapture. That's not something that, that's revealed. It says, nor do the angels of heaven, they don't know it, except only one, and that is my father, Yeshua is speaking, my father alone. Look at verse 37. In verse 37, he speaks about no, the days of Noah. And let me ask Gary, the flood that, that destroyed this world and brought about kind of a new beginning, would you see, would you agree with that the flood is a type of, uh, it symbolizes God's judgment, God's wrath? I don't know if Gary's with us, Simo. How about you? Oh, Take yes. Uh, it is definitely uh, a judgment against the ungodly. So, yes. And, and we need to make a distinction between two things. When Messiah comes for the second coming, not speaking in this sentence about the rapture, but when he speaks about the second coming, it is at the end of God pouring out his wrath. We have some very specific signs in the book of Revelation. We have those trumpet judgments, which is clearly the wrath of God and, and God's wrath poured out in a very harsh and strong way when we speak about those bold judgments or vials, depending upon your, your translation. And, and these judgments, both the trumpets and the, the bowls, are unique. The one thing that we can say about these judgments is that there gives no human explanation. And one of the things that bothers me is when Bible teachers try to explain these in human terms. That they say, oh, this is a certain type of helicopter. This is a nuclear war or what. When we look at it, it's ridiculous to think anything other than these are unique plagues that only come from heaven. There's no human scientific explanation for them. Yeah, I do agree. So, so, so when, when those plagues come and it's going to be unique and it's not going to be things as normal. But when we go to verse 36, 
Look at it again, talking about those days and that hour. No one knows. Speaking here about the rapture, it says, look at verse 37. But just as the days of Noah, thus will be also the coming of the Son of Man. And here, that coming is referring to the rapture. And we can prove it. It's not speaking about the second coming, but it's speaking of the rapture. Now, how can I be so sure and dogmatic? Well, let's keep reading. Look at verse 38. For just as were the days before the flood, what were people doing? Eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage. This is a description of things as normal. There was nothing unique. Only Noah was working and working and working, following God. But there was no... No, all these heavenly signs or something before the flood, it was only the preaching of no, this, this righteous man. But when we look before the second coming, you can go to the book of Revelation and see all these things that are, are plagues and judgments and how a third is going to be destroyed of this, a third of this, and then. All the things that speak about the destruction of this world in very specific terms. It will not be prior to the second coming things as normal. So look again at verse 38. For just as were the days before the flood. Individuals were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they did not know until. That flood came, and knows what it says. And literally, uh, Simo, if you're following along there in the Discovery Bible, when it says that they, let's see, I'm looking now, it says in verse 39, the flood came and it says took them away. But if you do a good study of this, this word, and if we look at it in, in Greek, it's the word that relates to lifting up, arrow in, in Greek, to raise, to take up. So it's very important that we see that this is a reference to be taken up in the same way that the waters come, that judgment, and it lifted up the boat, that ark. This is a reference. And notice something else here. If we keep reading in, in verse 39, thus will be also. The coming of the Son of Man. And then he gives us a very poignant description of this. He says, then two will be in the field. And it says, one will be, will be taken and the other left. Then it says, two, and this is feminine, two will be, will be uh, working at the mill. And one will be taken and one will be left. So it doesn't have to do with being in some specific location or doing something specifically, the fact of whether God is going to take, lift one up in the rapture, it all has to do with have they accepted the sufficiency of the cross, that gospel message. But isn't it interesting that, that when, when Yeshua is teaching, he speaks about the days of Noah and how Noah and his family was removed and preserved from the, the judgment, the wrath of God, so too are people going to be removed and taken so that they do not experience the wrath of God. So verses 36 through 41 clearly is teaching about the rapture happening before God's wrath, but not before persecution, because if we go back to verses 6, 7, 8, all the way up to verse uh, 13, in this passage, Matthew 24, it speaks about persecution that will be hated, that, that will be betrayed, that, that we will be turned over to death. So we're going to be persecuted, but we will not experience God's wrath. That is what Yeshua taught. Any responses from, from both of you? Hmm. Well, wrath. Uh, next, uh, go yeah, ahead. yeah, go ahead, Samuel. You first, please. 
Yeah, uh, this, as you brought up correctly, um, uh, Baruch, we are not promised to be taken out of tribulation. We are promised to be sealed and protected during the time of tribulation when the wrath of God comes down upon the ungodly during that time uh, from the abomination of desolation. We will be um, protected. Yes, there will be difficult times but for those who are his saints, we will be guarded like Noah was with his family. Well, here again, I think that, that what I heard is, is uh, conflicting with what, what we, we learn. Because we, we will be protected in the midst of tribulation, persecution. God will not leave us nor abandon us. Even if we lose our life, that's okay. But we will not be here when God's wrath comes. I think what's really important is this. We need to show that there's two different biblical words. And most people don't make a distinction of this, and this is, is quite problematic. And that is we have the word philipsis, which speaks of tribulation. And it's a very general term. It can relate to a whole bunch of different things, and you're on it right now, philipsis. But then there's another word, a different word entirely, and that is the word orgi. Some will say orge, and this is speaking about God's wrath. We are going to be in the midst of tribulation. People are suffering tribulation now, and it's going to get worse and worse for our faith. But no believer who have accepted the gospel prior to God's wrath falling, will experience God's wrath. I want to say that again. No one who has received the gospel prior to the beginning of God's wrath falling, none of those people will ever experience God's wrath. We will be removed, lifted up. So it's very important that we see God's preserving, helping us to endure tribulation, but his removing us by means of the rapture prior to his wrath falling. Yeah, Baruch, uh, labels are both a hindrance and helpful, but people use them in trying to study the subject of future things, eschatology. I, how would you, would you say that you fall into that view that is often called the pre-wrath position? And if so, how would you differentiate it from the very commonly held view, post-tribulational, post-trib rap, uh, rapture versus a pre-wrath rapture? E excellent question, because it really deals with uh, the heart of the, the issue here. Um, those who believe that the rapture is pre-wrath, and, and I see verses that promise that, this word for, you mentioned the word for uh, rapture. You, you mentioned euphoria and such from the Latin meaning. But when we look at the, the Greek meaning of arpazo, it has to do with a removal, not a preserving in the midst of. So the, the view of a post-tribulational rapture, meaning at the end of Daniel's 70th week, at the end of both persecution and God's wrath being poured out, they would say that, that God preserves the church in the midst of God's wrath. But, but they have no explanation for the verses we just read about one being taken, one being left. And when we look at what God promises, it's a snatching away. So the pre-wrath view means that the rapture will happen prior to God's wrath being poured out. We will be taken away, removed, and be in heaven with him. The post-tribulational view means that the people, believers, the church will be left here for the entire time of Daniel's 70th week until the second coming where they'll meet him in the air and then immediately return with him. And, and such a view has no explanation for it. the problems with it is twofold. They have no explanation for what is the way to understand the verses we read 
in verses 40 and 41 of Matthew 24. Secondly, they are, are, are problem, their view is problematic in the, the meaning of this word for being removed, taken away, and the, the imagery that we saw with Noah not uh, uh, being lifted up. Noah didn't suffer the, the judgment. He was above the waters, not in the midst of the waters. And that is a important, not just not just symbolic, but very meaningful in the, the description. Well, Baruch, I think our listeners would like you to take another level of explanation a step further. How would you respond to um, many that take the post-trib position believe that while there's wrath in the seals and in the trumpets, even as God's people experience hard times and tribulation in the exiles of 722 BC with the Assyrians or the 586 exile with the Babylonians, that what we're spared from are the concentrated wrath of God in the final bowls. And um, the, the church goes up through to the day of the Lord, that is the end of the last day of the tribulation, and that we the, the church escapes the wrath of the bowls, but goes up into the seventh trumpet. How do you, uh, what's, the, what's the demerits or what do you find the weaknesses of that position? Okay, For, uh, first of all, I would, would strongly argue and say that the seal judgments do not originate from, from God. They're not parts of his judgment or his wrath. The source of them, when you look at it, it is the one who's called death and Haiti follows after him. So this is not of God, but this is satanic in nature. Secondly, I would, would, would point out that when we, we look at the view of the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord I would not say that there's any biblical basis for simply saying that's the very end of God's wrath. But the day of the Lord has a sign that that announces it, for example. And, and this gets at the heart. If someone looks at and maybe Simul, you know, you're doing such a good job and we appreciate yeah. your, your service. If we could go to Joel for a moment, the book of Joel in the English is chapter two. In Hebrew, it's chapter 3, but we'll look at it first in English. Joel chapter 2. And towards the end, I, I believe we'll begin in verse uh, 27. Someone uh, along that verse. I'm going to switch and look here in my, my Bible. Joel chapter 2. And we see something. God's word is very precise. And I think the, the detractment of, uh, that's a word, the detracting of the view that you shared is that it doesn't pay attention to all the biblical clues. So if we look here, when it says, uh, let's begin in verse, <coughs> would this be the uh, verse, let me look at here. How about verse 30? It says, uh, I will set wonders in heaven and upon earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. And then it says something very specifically. Next verse, this is verse 4 in, ch in chapter 3 in the Hebrew. I believe it's verse, what is it in uh, English? Chapter 2 and verse 31. The sun will turn to darkness and the moon, what does it say here? The moon will turn to blood. When will it turn to blood? Before the coming of the day of the Lord, that great and awesome or terrible day of the Lord. So we see something here. There is a sign that announces God's day of the Lord, his wrath. Now, let's go to another place because the word of God is so specific. It gives us the answers. If we, we, we study to show ourselves approved, look now to Revelation chapter 6. We're speaking about the seals. Revelation chapter 6. And notice what 
what the word of God says here. Revelation 6 and let's begin in verse verse 12. I looked and when the sixth seal was opened up, there was uh, uh, confusion. I don't know how it's translated in your Bible, but but uh, happenings. There was an earthquake, a great earthquake. And then notice the same words. John takes them from Joel. The sun became black as sackcloth. And notice the moon, all of it became like blood. The stars of the heavens fell. We see this also in Joel and fell to the earth and the figs were shaken as when a strong wind uh, turns them. And then notice something. When does this all happen? What's bringing this about? Well, let's drop down to verse, verse 17. It tells us when this is going to happen. When this sun is going to turn dark and the moon turns red like blood, it's going to happen when, look at verse 17, for is coming the great day of the Lord's anger, who will be able to stand. So what announces God's wrath is not the seal judgments, but rather it is the sun turning dark and the moon to, to red like blood. That is announced, that symbols in the six. But before, before that wrath falls, the wrath of the Lamb, the day of the Lord happens, two events are going to take place, and we see them in Revelation 7. What are they? The sealing of, of the tribes of Israel. And the second thing is that there's going to be those who come out of the great tribulation. Revelation chapter 7, beginning in verse 9. There's going to be those who come out of not great tribulation, but the great tribulation. And these, this language is so important because Israel goes through great tribulation. But believers in Messiah Yeshua, for the sake of, the sake of. Uh, now, if you look here, um, you're looking at Revelation chapter 7, verse four, four, uh, 14, right? And it says, these yes. are the ones that come out of the great tribulation, the great tribulation. Both definite articles are there, most informing. Now, it's not just exclusively that, but John is writing with an emphasis when he writes this book. He's writing specifically to those believers in the last days. That's the emphasis. So he's going to put the emphasis on those in the last days. This is not to to. Ignore those who who have believed and have already died and gone to be with the Lord. But the emphasis here is is those believers, those disciples in the last days. So, so Baruch, uh, just to clarify for those listening, you distinguish between a great tribulation in Matthew 24 and maybe verse 21 and the great tribulation here. What is the difference? The difference is the the great tribulation happens prior to the wrath of God, and it's aimed at believers. And the reason why the definite article is there is because it is important to God, those who suffer for his faith. Great tribulation is going to happen to Israel in the last days. And it's this, this great tribulation without the definite articles, a, a great a a great tri or simply great tribulation, not the great. It's going to happen. So what to is Israel. the great? Um, what is the great tribulation pointing to for believers? It, as I said, it is pointing to a time of intense persecution, suffering, and death that those who believe in Messiah Yeshua, Christ Jesus, that they're going to suffer for their faith. Is that before the abomination of desolation? Yes. Oh. Ex excellent question. Yes, it's before the abomination of desolation up to and at that moment. Like, but uh, but just repeat that again, please. The the great tribulation begins 
prior to, it begins, I believe, in Daniel's, when Daniel's 70th week begins, maybe even before that, and it goes to, for the most part, the abomination of desolation. And that's why we see in Matthew 24, after the abomination of desolation, the emphasis turns to Israel and great tribulation they go through, not the great tribulation, but great tribulation. So the emphasis of the great tribulation are those who are suffering for faith specifically by name, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, suffering for him. I see. So um, where in Revelation, um, for those who are watching, and um, it's uh, what you are saying is, um, I believe, the mixed revelation view. That at no, the, um, no, it's very, it's very, excuse for the interruption, but it's okay. very incorrect to put, associate the pre wrath view with the mid tribulation. Okay. The mid tribulation has right. many different aspects to it that the pre wrath okay. does not share. So, although, right. although the timing is similar, the, the views okay. have some very significant differences. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks for clarifying. So, the rapture occurs before the abomination of desolation. No, no, did, did, no, did not say that. Okay. It happens okay. soon thereafter. No one knows the day or soon the after, after, but we have to remember. Let's go back to the text. If we go back to Matthew 24, where we began. Okay. And, and Yeshua speaks very specifically. He says, let's go to verse 20, of chapter 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end comes. Then notice that mm -hmm. in verse 15 he says, Therefore, whenever you, it's still speaking you, referring to believers, whenever you see the abomination of desolation, the word, according to Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then when we immediately thereafter, it goes to Israel, beginning in verse 16. So it this agrees totally with what Paul says in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 when he says the day of Christ. And we talked about this last, last time. The day of Christ does not say the day of the Lord. If you check the Texas Receptus, you check uh, the best Greek manuscripts. And I'm speaking of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I believe verse 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. It tells us that the emphasis is our gathering together unto him. See, this is why it's so important to use all the clues that the word of God gives us. If we look here, and I'm going to read on with what you're putting on, uh, um, it says, and in, in you're using the uh, um, the New American Standard, it says the day of the Lord has come, but if you look at the Texas Receptus, it says the day of Christ, or the King James, the day of Christ. And can we go back up to verse 1? Sure. See, what when we speak about the second coming, Messiah is coming to Jerusalem, ultimately, to establish his kingdom. But notice what it says here. and I'm going to translate it literally out of the, the uh, Texas Receptus, verse 1. Paul is speaking, and he's speaking specifically to believers. He says, but we beseech you, brethren, that is brothers and sisters, in behalf of the coming of our Lord Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ, and here's the key, and are, not everyone, are gathering unto him. And if you look at this in the Greek, it's emphasized in a very unique way because it says, are gathering, the word for are gathering, we all know the word synagogue means coming together. But this word has a prefix. If you look at the Greek, it says epi. Synagogues, 
So this is gathering unto, and then you would not need unto him. This is redundant. It's It would be seen as poor classical Greek, but it's marvelous Koine Greek because it emphasizes us being gathered together unto, unto him. And this refers to the rapture, and that's why it speaks of the day of Christ. And, and let me just give one simple proof for that. Everyone tells, I, I don't know a commentator that does not say that the, the second epistle to the Thessalonians, it was written, especially chapter two, for those who were concerned that they missed out on something. Well, they wouldn't be concerned that they missed out on the day of the Lord. You'd be concerned if you were in the day of the Lord, his judgment, his wrath. They were concerned that they missed out on the day of Christ. And that is a reference to us gathering unto him where not in Jerusalem, not in this world, but but being taken, removed prior to the wrath of God. And notice if we keep reading in Second Thessalonians chapter two, it promises that that day of Christ will not happen until the apostasy happens and the revealing of the Antichrist. And it says exactly what that revealing is when he stands and takes his place, exalts himself in the sanctuary. I think that you're, you're right there in verse four. Notice where it says, who opposes yes. and exalts himself above everything that is called God or object of worship. So he takes his seat and let's do this. If you look here, it says temple. This is a horrible translation. It's not the temple because the word temple is Hiron. This is not the word temple. This is referring to the sanctuary. It's the Greek word neos. So we have to pay attention to the language, the original language. It's not Heron temple referring to that in a general sense, but it's referring to Neos, that sanctuary, and in this case, the Holy of Holies. And that's why unless someone is really paying attention to the biblical vocabulary, they're going to, to miss out on the marvelous, inerrant word that, that God has provided us. Great, Baruch. Thanks so much for taking us through these uh, scriptures today. Thank you, Baruch. And as we're coming to a, uh, as we're coming to a close here, how can um, we as believers um, prepare ourselves for this great day? I think Gary should answer that. You know, our time on earth is so limited by the measure of eternity. Seriously, I'm. I'm at a tender 70 years old and I'm, a, I'm aware of the brevity of time, but God's bringing us to his triumph. I don't want to sound trite or, or just cliche-ish, but oh, he is worthy. And tribulations have a way when they bring in the fire to clear out the impurities of that wonderful work of God of gold within us. Let's serve him with all of our heart and all of our soul and with all that we've got, for he is worthy. And you would say so? Oh, amen. Hallelujah. Isn't it wonderful that uh, it says we should not be quickly shaken um, from our composure or be disturbed in Second Thessalonians 2 verse 2. And as, these, um, as, as there's a lot of tribulation in this world, as uh, Baruch, you have explained so well, we must go through many tribulation, the great tribulation that we're going to experience, but we will be uh, taken at, at God's appointed time. Um, and we will see um, the uh, man of lawlessness revealing himself and we will be taken afterwards. And that is when the wrath of God will be poured out and we have every reason to uh, prepare ourselves for intense persecution. Uh, the world is really um, <laughs> turning against Christians. And rather than that uh, setting us back, we should be having our head lifted up high, uh, thanking God that we are protected during that time. We have the Holy Spirit in us to uh, take us through. And we must be in Scripture so we don't get... Um, confused by the thinking of the world, but rather be renewed in our renewed mind, uh, be transformed. So praise the Lord. Yes.
I, I have a list of 28 questions that people need to answer. And what I'd like to do is uh, send this symbol. I will uh, put it in a nice order, send it to, to you okay. so that those who registered for, for our uh, uh, Straight Kingdom Talk edition tonight, Great. that they'll get it. And we'll also make it available to all who are subscribers to our app, My Bible Study. Uh, we'll put that through through a, a uh, blast so those people as well will get it because we're not trying to get people to agree with us. We want people to study these things. And this these questions are vital and to go into the scripture and study to show themselves approve and be thoroughly convinced in their own mind what the word of God shares. Yes. Amen. So I want to encourage all of us here, as we have heard about the rapture, not to wait for it to happen, but to prepare ourselves, because we do not know the day or the hour, but um, there will be signs, and unless we are prepared, we will be taken by surprise, and, um, and the flood will come, and we won't be in the ark. <laughs> so that will be incorrect. So thank you very much. Um, would you like to pray for us, Baruch, as we close here? Sure. Father God, we, we exalt you. We thank you for the promise of your salvation through our Lord, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his obedience, his humility, that he humbled himself to go to that cross to provide the only way of salvation, the only redemption, the only forgiveness of our sins. And Lord, we pray right now that if there is someone who's listening who has not accepted his death on that cross for the full payment of their sin. They would simply say, oh God, I am a sinner. I trust in, in Christ's death, the shedding of his blood for my redemption, the payment of my sin. I invite him into my life to be my savior. And I want to serve you, not to save me by my service, but to save me so I can serve in obedience to your will. Father God, we love you so much. We thank you that you will never leave us nor forsake us and that, that you are indeed sovereign, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And it's in your son's name, Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thanks so much, um, Baruch. And we're going to continue to be in our Bibles. Uh, no, answer those questions you will send our way and um, we'll pass it on. So uh, those of you who have questions, um, please uh, feel free to reach out uh, to our ministries. And you've seen, um, as Baruch mentioned, by the Discovery Bible that will help you with these questions and other resources as well. So thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you soon on the next session. Bye.